I was sitting thinking about, you can see this is a bit of a preamble. You know why? Because what I wanted to speak about was something that is called sanctification. Oh, it's a terrible thing. You know any religious word that's that long, you know it just, people say oh, it just can't be good. I don't even know what it means, but I just know it's not good. They just, there's fear and trembling that comes upon people. And then you start talking a little bit more and you say, well, sanctification, if you really just talk about it in a little more detail and kind of get down to what they're talking about, really what God's on about is the whole concept of holiness. Holiness! It's like the four-letter word in the Bible, you know. You get into serious trouble for even thinking it. But if you speak about it, that's the no-go. You just don't speak about holiness. There's something about holiness that people are very uncomfortable with because we have this perception, this idea about holiness, that holiness is something to be reckoned with. Holiness is something that's going to come and become a part of our lives and it's going to put us in a place of deprivation. It's going to take away from my life. The things that I enjoy, the things that I look forward to, the things that make me happy, those are the things that... that kind of going to be cut away and so you know I don't really want to be a Christian because my concept of what a complete committed Christian is all about is somebody who sucks lemons all week and walks around and they look very sanctimonious and they look very holy but really I don't really want to be them so it's a preconceived idea that we have by the way I forgot to tell you this because I had to leave the reading out until next week because we're not going to have time for it. But I'm speaking to you today about a subject that I've titled, Help, I'm Boring. <laughs> and so what we end up doing is we start thinking about holiness and then we have people who sit and say, you know what, I love God so much and I'm so committed to God that really what I want to do is I want to live a life that's pleasing to Him because I understand that if I live a life pleasing to God, it positions me in a place where I will receive and experience the goodness of God in my life. I understand that God is not a person who's involved in anything outside of the kingdom of God, anything to do with the kingdom of the world and my past life. So I want to get rid of that stuff and I really want to embrace Embrace everything that I believe is going to make me holy. And so I start going through my list of all the things that I think are just so terrible in my life. And I start off with laughter because I don't think God's actually funny. God does not have a sense of humor. And so we cut that out. And then we say, anything to do with prosperity, actually, the less I have, probably the holier I am. So we, let's not go down that road, so we get rid of those things. And then anything that I enjoy in life, God, I mean, there's nothing of God in enjoyment. So let's get rid of any enjoyment out of our lives. So we get rid of that, and we start throwing things out of our lives, and we jettison things left, right, and center. And before we, we know it, we end up at a place, and we look around, and we say, you know what, if I have to look at my life right now, I must be a very holy person. I'm not happy, but I'm very holy. <laughs> the problem with it is, you have a look at that, but nobody really wants to be around you. Because the problem with it is, you've got rid of everything, and now you're boring. <laughs> you dull, because you have nothing to offer. What you've ended up doing is throwing everything out of your life, getting rid of everything that added color and value and texture to your life. And I'm not talking about bad things. We all know some things are overtly bad. But we're talking about things that are left to your personal discretion. So we get rid of all of this stuff and we replace it with nothing. And then we wonder why we're not the light and the salt of the earth. Because we have nothing. We don't even have personality anymore. We want nothing to attract anybody. And God says, I want you to be the light and I want you to be the salt. I want you to go out there and make a difference. And we go out there and we try to tell people how holy we are and how good we are. And they say, well, all the best to you. Enjoy it. <laughs> Nobody wants a part of it. Why? Because we have a preconceived idea about what holiness is. And yet God says, my invitation that I extend to you is to be holy. He says, be holy as I am holy. He's calling us to a lifestyle of holiness. Where are we missing it? Because there's something that doesn't line up. I came to give you life of a superior nature, and in my pursuit of the superior life, I ended up in the ditch. What happened? 
If we do holiness and we do it right, what holiness affords us and what holiness offers us is an opportunity to step into fullness of life. What holiness offers us is an opportunity to live a life with design, with purpose, and with goals. It offers us the opportunity to have impetus and to have drive and to have enthusiasm with the way that we live life. I know you can't see it just yet. Just trust me. This is the preamble. We're going somewhere. God's design for holiness is intentional. And he's taking us and his invitation is to step into holiness because it brings with it the reward of fullness of life. When we decide that we want to step into holiness and we do it wrong, it ends up with me being miserable and everybody else thinking I'm boring. You appraise your life for yourself. So what is this idea, this little concept called holiness? Why is God looking for us to be holy? Why is it such a big thing in his economy? Why is God sitting saying to us, I'm looking for you to be holy? Why? If you look through the scriptures, do you know that throughout scripture, God is referred to as a holy God. What are they talking about? Why do they call him a holy God? Because that's who he is. It is his nature. God is not holy because of his attributes. God is not holy because of the things that he does. God is not holy because he goes around doing holy good things. God is holy because that's who he is. It is his nature. And what flows out of his nature is holiness. That's everything he gets involved in. It ha it's a representation of him and his nature. Not only is it holiness part of God's nature, do you know that God is the agent of holiness? Nowhere in the Bible where it calls us and invites us to step into holiness is it ever presented to us without a member of the Godhead being present as an agent to bring about that change. Nowhere. Who likes cake? Who likes chocolate cake? So, Vivian's decided that she's getting into baking. So she sits with Sarah. Now more stuff ends up out than in, but that's okay. It's all about the experience and the memory. So you get in and you start making your chocolate cake. And so you've put in your ingredients and you put in this and you put in that and you put in your sugar and your flour and your milk and your eggs and your vanilla essence and your everything else and you stir it up and you get it ready and you put it in the little tins and you put it in and you bake it and you take it out. But it's not chocolate cake. It might taste nice, it might look good, it may be well iced, but it's not chocolate cake. Why is it not chocolate cake? It's got no cocoa. God is the cocoa. God is holiness. You can do what you want to do. You can say what you want to say. You can live how you want to live. It may look really good. It may smell really good to people. It might taste really good. But you know what? There's no cocoa in it. If you got no cocoa, you got no holiness. <laughs> holiness is an invitation for you to walk into and experience the, the nature and the character of God. That's the invitation. What he's saying is, this is who I am. If you exclude me from what you do, it's never going to be holy. It may look really good. It may look fantastic. And you may enjoy it. But the fullness of who I am is not present in what you're doing. The nature is absent. Be holy as I am holy. The invitation that he's extending to you is to sit and say, I want you to be partakers of my nature. What he's saying is, I want you to invite me into experience with you. What he's saying is, it's all about living the abundant life. When you talk about that, it's so broad because when you talk about life, you're talking about all the multifaceted aspects of who you are, your relationships and your work. And in if you break it down, basically what he's saying is in your life situations, in your language, in your talking, in your communication, in your relationships, if you're looking for that to be holy, if you're looking for that to be sanctified, then I need to have a presence in it. If I have no presence, 
You can't ask me to bless it. I'm not there. Why is God inviting us into holiness? Because sanctification brings us to a place where we take of the nature of God and we impart it into our life situation. And we live in the expectation that the nature that's been presented and that's been planted in that situation is gonna bring forward whatever it has, whatever it is we're looking for. Let me give you an example. Who are my favorite people in the audience today? Husbands. So all the happy husbands fold your arms and sit back and look forward. Okay, just a, it's just a story, okay? If the cap fits, but I'll leave it at that. God says to you, you know what? I want you to, li- I want you to have a prosperous good marriage. That's what I'm looking for you to do. And we say, thanks God, that's great. Now, I've been praying for this for a long time. Can you tell me how it is that you're gonna change my wife? I'm so glad you finally heard my prayer. I'm very excited about this. And he says, well, now that you mention it, actually I'm talking to you. And you say, what? And he says, yeah. He said, listen, I've got to tell you a few things. He said, that hot secretary that you've got at work, you know what, you can go and you can go and mess around over there, but I want you to know something. You're stepping out of my will. Better what did you do? Because if you step out of that, I'm not a part of that. And then he says, and by the way, while we're on the subject, you know that pornography is no substitute for your wife. It's got very quiet. If I were you, I'd say amen. (laughs) If you say amen, everybody thinks we're not talking about you. It's not a substitute for your relationship. So I'm telling you, if you want to take of my nature and put my nature in there, you're gonna have to move away from that stuff. But I'll tell you what I want you to do. If you get obedient to me and you listen to what I tell you to do, I will come into that situation and I'll begin to change it. Okay, God, well, thank you. I look forward to that. He says, now I'll tell you what, I I want you to, I want you to take her on a date. I can take her on a date, not a problem. Sure, done. And when you take her on this date, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to talk to her. There's lots of stuff going on at work. I'll tell her all about it. He's like, no, no, I don't want you to talk to her about what's going on at work. I want you to talk to her about you. I want you to open up and I want you to express to her a little bit about what's happening inside you. What's going on in there? God, I'll tell you what. We will go on the date and I'll bring flowers. We try and negotiate with God. Why? What does the Bible say? about disobedience. You see, when we're not obedient to what God tells us to do, we never step into what he's called us to experience. What God is saying is, I'm extending to you an invitation to walk into the fullness of who I am. If you're looking for me to work in your situation, you're gonna have to be obedient to me. Because if you're not obedient to me, there's nothing I can do. When you're disobedient, what you do is, you take that situation and you don't sanctify the situation. You don't make it holy because none of my nature is in there. You can't sit and do that, you wanna change it, but you don't wanna be obedient to what I tell you to do. But then you still want me to bless it. And sometimes we wanna take flowers because sometimes we think, that sacrifice is gonna be a better option than obedience. And we try to negotiate with God. And it's like, God, I know you want me to make an effort in this area, but I'll tell you what, I'm gonna take some flowers. In fact, I'll make it a big bouquet. What are we doing? We're negotiating with God. And God's saying, I'm not looking for you to do that. I'm telling you what to do. So either you get obedient or you don't. Because if you don't get obedient, you can't look for my blessing.
this summer. Vivian learned how to swim. I don't know what you call them, because got, everybody's got their own name for it, whether they're armbands or floaties or whatever the things, everybody's got their own. The things that used to keep her afloat are no longer on her body, and she manages to stay afloat. And she loves it. She loves going for a swim. It's like, please take me swimming, and off she goes. And she gets down there, and she looks around, and she's so excited about it, and off she goes, and she jumps in the water. And she plays in the water. And she does all kinds of stuff. When you were born again, it's a lot like learning to swim. When you were born again, you were put in the water. You were sanctified. You got in the water. But once you get in the water, you've got to do something. When you start to do something in the water, when you discover the nature of water, you can start to do all kinds of things. She dives down to the bottom and picks things off the floor of the shallow end, and she jumps off and she does pencil jumps and bomb jumps and this jump, and she tries to do somersaults in the water, and she goes down the slide and she in the water. What is happening? She was in the water, and as she felt comfortable with water, and as she began to discover the nature of water, so it opened up all kinds of possibilities for her. When you got born again, you were sanctified. You got into the water. But part of sanctification means as you begin to discover the nature of the life that's been put inside of you, as you begin to discover the fullness of sanctification and holiness, the invitation is for you to begin to create out of that. You create your life. As human beings, God designed us to be people of discovery and people of creation. We are designed to discover about the life that's come to dwell within us, the fullness of, of all that Jesus has provided for us. What he's inviting us to do is come in, discover that stuff, and when he speaks to you, walk into an experience with him. If we don't walk into an experience with him, what we end up doing is accumulating a whole bunch of facts and knowledge and information about God, which is good and wonderful, but it doesn't change my life. Unless there's an experience, unless there's, there's an encounter with God in those particular areas, whichever area he's revealing to you, nothing happens in your life. That's why we have so many Christians who know a lot of stuff, who are very enthusiastic, who are looking forward to God, but there's nothing really alive in their life. There's nothing vibrant. God's called you to create, create. He's called you to be people who are holy, people who are sanctified, people who begin to discover the fullness of what's inside. And as I make a discovery, I sit and say, wow, I see how that could influence my relationship and my situation and my work and my everything. And what do I do with it? I take it and I take my faith and I begin to walk into that, living in the expectation that as I begin to be obedient to God, walking in faith, things begin to change in my life. The invitation to holiness is an invitation to successful living. It's an invitation to purpose, which I'll get into next week. But your purpose is hinged on holiness. It's about impartation. The life that's within me, the life that's imparted to me, understanding that, discovering it, and walking into a, re a reality in my life. It's not about imitation. Imitation is something very different. Imitation is recognizing the fact that God wants certain things from me, but rather than being dependent on God to bring that about in my life, rather than being dependent on Him to bring the fulfillment of that, what I do is I take it into my own hands and I decide what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and make it happen. So I engage in that and I start to adjust my life and my circumstances and everything else so that it looks like and it imitates what it should be. But there's no life there. There's no reality there. 